a language that a child can acquire it, and a child that they can acquire a language. This was a question, uh, adapting one formerly posed by Walter McCulloch about uh, humans and numbers, that uh, has been a major uh, obsession in my career as a cognitive scientist, starting with graduate school. I took an interest in it because Noam Chomsky had made it a famous controversy within cognitive science. He had taken a strong nature stance in the age-old nature-nurture debate when it came to language. He famously argued, again in uh, contrast to B.F. Skinner, that children came wired with an ability to acquire a language. It's part of what it means to be a human. And children obviously can't be born with any particular language because we know that a child in Japan learns to speak Japanese and in Spain learns to speak Spanish or Kwakutl or uh, Yoruba or whatever the surrounding language has to be. But on the other hand, you expose a child to any of the world's 6,000 languages and the child will end up speaking. You expose a a house cat or a chimpanzee to the same stimuli and they don't end up speaking. So what's the difference? I wanted to make sense of it from the point of view of what is the, the algorithm that uh, the child is born with, so to speak, the, the mental circuitry that allows them to go from hearing parents and, and other kids go wow, 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 and then a couple of years later being able to hold up their end of the conversation, whatever the language is. Um, it's, it's almost a miracle. How, do, how does that happen? There was a field of child language acquisition when I was a graduate student. My other advisor, Roger Brown, was one of the pioneers. But I always found it a little bit unsatisfying that you could really spend uh, all day listening to kids talk and still not get any insight as to uh, what makes them so good at it. To this day, uh, nothing beats a child, including our best artificial intelligence systems. You ask a Siri, uh, question or uh, Cortana or any of the uh, computer assistants, they're, they're pretty impressive compared to the way they were 10 years ago. But on the other hand, they're also in, in many ways incredibly stupid. You ask an artificial intelligence system, uh, did uh, George Washington use a computer? And what you'll get back is a computer program at George Washington High School. That is, they kind of know what the words are, but they don't actually parse the syntax to figure out who did what to whom kids do by the time they're, they're three or four. How do they do it? Now, Chomsky suggested that kids are born with a language acquisition device, not a gadget, but a way of referring to the preparation of brain circuitry. I was curious as to how it worked. What, what algorithm did it uh, implement? Uh, even though I was not a student of Chomsky's, I wasn't particularly sympathetic to the idea of an in innate universal grammar. But thinking through what it would take, uh, I started to warm up to the idea when I realized that no learning device can be a, a tabula rasa, a blank slate. Because given any input, this is an old uh, conundrum in philosophy, there are always an infinite number of conclusions that you can draw from it, all of them consistent with the input. David Hume famously uh, pointed this out. It's sometimes called the scandal of induction. No matter what the evidence uh, consists of, there are many ways of leaping from the information given. You've got a bunch of points. There are all kinds of curves you could draw uh, from it. In the case of a child, what prevents the child from parroting back the sentences that they hear? That's learning, but we don't count that as language acquisition. Or using all the words, but in you know, any old order, or making the kind of grammatical errors that an adult struggling with a language might make. Even the, the tourist has learned something, but the child's learning is different. What makes it different? Uh, I realized that with any learning device, there has to be some kind of organization or preparation or constraints or tuning of the learning device to the problem being faced, whether it is learning to recognize shapes, learning to control arms and legs, uh, learning how the world works, learning a language. This shaped my later understanding of other nature-nurture debates in psychology. Namely, there can't be a dichotomy. Is it nature or nurture? Language is the obvious case in which it's got to be some complex combination because, again, children learn to speak, cats don't, so it's got to be uh, nature. Uh, kids exposed to English learn English. Kids exposed to Japanese learn Japanese. There's got to be nurture. 
Hate to interrupt. Wouldn't you prefer uninterrupted indulgence? Head to findqualia.com to access the entire series by the genius Steven Pinker, completely ad-free. The problem is always, what is the learning device? What is the instinct to learn, as Darwin put it, that natural selection implanted in us? And then that kind of makes the nature-nurture contrast almost go away. There is learning, there is an effect of the environment, but only because there is a learning algorithm, a learning mechanism, a learning circuitry that can do the learning in the first place. So that was a, a kind of epiphany as to how to think clearly about uh, biology and culture, nature and nurture, heredity and environment, genes and experience. Okay, well, uh, what does that have to do with how, how the child can acquire language? Another epiphany uh, that I had was that it is not just a case of cryptography. That is, it's not as if the child is like a World War II codebreaker who gets a set of signals uh, with an unknown message and has to try to figure out what are the statistical probabilities of one sound coming after another sound. For one thing, that's not what language is for. We don't just go blah, 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 blah and make, make sound. We use language to convey meaning, to get ideas in other people's heads, to win friends and influence people. And the child is not just an auditory system in a box that is just processing sound. Kids interact with the world. They interact with their parents and their siblings. And anyone who plays with a baby knows that even before the baby can talk, an awful lot is going on in the baby's head. The, the baby is making sense of the world, keeping track of cause and effect and physical objects and the intentions of other people. A fascinating field of science pioneered by uh, two of my colleagues, Susan Carey and Elizabeth Spelke. Uh, well, based in part on their ideas that there is a rich mental life in the child prior to acquiring a language, the fact that a language itself is not just a bunch of sounds, it's not like scat singing, like you know, shooby dooby doo uh, but it means something, meant that the way of conceptualizing the problem of language acquisition suddenly became clear. Namely, the baby who's already making sense of the world has a kind of inkling, a kind of guess as to what the parent, say, is trying to get across and juxtaposes that with the sounds coming out of the parent's mouth or the gestures in the case of a signing parent. And the task is to map the meaning guessed from the context with the sound. That at least sets the stage, and I tried to work out what the algorithm was that took a meaning on the one hand and a sound on the other, and tried to pull out the rules uh, that would order the subject before the verb, if that's the way the language worked, or the verb before the subject, if that's the way the language worked, so that the child would not be stuck with just parroting back sentences, but could slot new words and express uh, new concepts. Which again, as soon as you play with kids, you know that they do. They say all kinds of things that they didn't hear directly from uh, their parents. Mommy, can I put my head in the mailbox so the mailman can know where I are? Even before that, a child having their hands washed because there's jam on their fingers, the child might say, all gone sticky. Something that was their own coinage, their own creation, showing that the creative ability to combine words into using rules and patterns is there uh, from, from the get-go. Another implication of this overall picture of language acquisition is that it shows that language and thought can't be the same thing. If they were, how would you ever learn a language? Given that the way that thoughts are expressed in words differ from language to language, uh, you would have a vicious circle if thought consisted only of uh, language, Rather, some kind of thought has to occur before there's language in order to make it possible for the child to learn a language in the first place. Images are part of that non-linguistic understanding of the world that allows the child to kind of pull, pull herself up by her bootstraps to get into the language system, but also more abstract understanding of cause and effect, who did what to whom, uh, what the philosopher Jerry Fodor called mental ease the hypothetical language of thought, which is in the child's brain before they start to try to crack the code of language itself. <laughs>